From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Roy Vickers, New Britain Mutual, Johnny. Hi, Roy. How'd you like to try some Creole cooking? Okay, what's up? One of the bellhops at the St. Agnes Hotel in New Orleans had quite a time last night. He opened the safe and walked out with $7,500 in cash and a diamond necklace worth a cool $25,000. So help me, Roy. I didn't know bellhops had so much fun. That isn't all. He also stole a station wagon belonging to the hotel manager, not to mention the manager's wife. What do you want back? Mainly that necklace. It's the property of one of our clients. She was stopping at the St. Agnes and had it stowed in the hotel safe. Any line on the bellhop? Not a trace so far. The wife? Don't be funny. Can you hop a plane down there and see what's happened for us? Sure, Roy. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Britain Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Valentine matter. Expense account item one, $175 and no cents. Airfare and the incidental cost it takes to get from Hartford to New Orleans. Once there, I was more than surprised to discover the police had wound up the whole case. The prodigal bellhop, along with the $7,500 in cash, the diamond necklace, the station wagon, even the manager's wife had all been recovered. Everything and everyone tearful, but intact. I reported this development to all parties concerned, phoned the airport for a reservation back to Hartford, which they said would be the following afternoon, and then looked around for something to do. I found a spot on Burgundy Street that seemed to be less crowded than the others and settled down for the evening. That's where it happened. He was sitting alone, tall, gray-haired, rugged. A face full of some 50-odd years, I guessed, and full of some other things no one could guess. It was three drinks at the bar before I made out who he was, who he had been. A man who was once big, in a way that only prohibition made them big. This seat taken? No. Mind if I sit down, Mr. Valentine? Well, you can't be that old. How old? Old enough to recognize me. Recognize you from your picture. Long time ago. Time. Hmm. I guess I could tell you more about that than anybody. You a cop? No, I'm an insurance investigator. You were a cop once? Once. Can I buy you a drink, Mr. Valentine? Dan's enough. Sure. You're doing better than the boys in the force. I've been living in New Orleans for three months now. Nobody's calling me. Any reason why they should? No. No, there isn't. But then no one's ever figured out a way to stop a policeman from making a visit when he wants to. Uh, that's true. That's yeah, a funny thing. There's a lot of policemen I've liked in my day. Visiting policemen. That is, on certain days. You're too young to remember much about it, Dollar, but a long time ago, a bunch of old women made a law called the uh, Volstead Act. Sure. Prohibition. Everybody heard about it. Including the old women who passed the law. You see, this law was supposed to be for the other guy, not for them. Anyhow, a lot of people started bottling up violations of this Ballstead Act. You tired? No, not a bit, Dan. Well, I got me a lot of money and a lot of trouble. Thirteen years for income tax evasion, finally. Ended just three months ago when I came here to live happily ever after. Funny. No. New Orleans is a nice, quiet place to live. Better still, no one's bothering you. That's the way I want to keep it. And they can pass a thousand stupid laws, and I'm not going to fall for any of them. Everything the book says, everything in order. How's that sound? Pretty good. You believe it? Yes, I do. Then I've got my point over. I'm flattered that you recognize me, Dollar. I paid back ten days for every one I took. Now, all I ask is that you don't ask the police to bother me. Okay. As far as I'm concerned, Dan, you didn't even have the dinner I'm about to buy for you. Dollar, it's nice to come out of prison and be recognized by a nice guy. Where we go, Jimmy Moran's? That's where we went, and it was a swell dinner. Only Dan Valentine didn't eat much of it. 
He tried to smile and crack wise, but there was a sadness about him that stood in the way. I wanted to ask him more questions about those days back when, but I didn't. We dropped into a couple of other places. The Absinthe House, Joe Glorioso's. We listened to some jazz and drank Sazeracs and walked along Canal Street. Finally, we shook hands and said goodnight. Expense account item two, $26.26. Hotel, board, and miscellaneous. The next morning, I packed my bags, checked out of my hotel, and was about to take a limousine out to Mobile Eye Airport. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. A message for you. Oh, thanks. It was from a police officer on the New Orleans force, an inspector DeBaca. Could I drop by before I left town? I went right over and met DeBaca, a tall, lean, gray-haired man with 30 years' service who kind of puzzled me at first. Thanks for coming by, Donna. Sure. Sit down. What's up? The bellhop take back his confession on that necklace theft? No, no. This is something else, Donna. Dan Valentine. Oh. You met him about 6.30 last night. You had two drinks with him, and you went over to Moran's and had dinner. You went to two other places. You left him at 11.30. Yeah. I also brushed my teeth when I got back to the hotel, but I bet you can't tell me what color my pajamas are. Now, take it easy. Just take it easy. Maybe I'm saying this bad. He doesn't know it, but we've been keeping an eye on Danny ever since he showed up in New Orleans. Just so happened you were with him last night, and you did business with us here yesterday afternoon. So? We want to know if you had any business with Dan Valentine. Don't be funny, Inspector. Okay, okay. Now, don't get huffy. Let me put it this way. Dan came to New Orleans three months ago, bought a house out in Jefferson Parish. He hired a housekeeper, bought himself a little car, took up fishing every afternoon or just walking. Nothing wrong with that? No, of course there isn't. We liked it fine. The boys in the car drive by now and then, look at him, just look. No questions, no knocking on the door. When we see Danny in town, we turn the other way. Just look, you see? Sure. Now, he doesn't have any visitors. No old pals from Chicago or New York or Detroit come to see him. He lives alone. And he likes it. That's what he told me. You're his first visitor. Now, I just wondered... You wondered wrong, DeBaca. Okay, okay. I had to ask about it. You know how it is. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Right on cue. Your pal just stopped a couple of bullets. Huh? Danny Valentine. Come on. According to the uniformed officer who had put in the call, a newspaper boy had found Valentine lying on the sidewalk and aroused the neighborhood. One of the residents had carried him inside. The ambulance crew stood by the bed as we came in. Valentine was lying on his back, the white chenille spread under him changing to a deep red. Two bullets had ripped ragged holes in one shoulder through flesh and bone. But he was just as self-contained as ever. I got the idea you were going to stay out of trouble, Dan. I didn't know I was in any trouble. Are you, Dollar? Okay. You went to the police after all? No. The inspector called me in. About you, Dan, but let's forget that for now. How'd this happen? This? Cleaning my gun. You're a loser, Dan. You're not supposed to have a gun. Oh, you know me and the law. We sometimes didn't hit it off. Art, where is the gun? What gun? The gun you were cleaning when you were walking down the street and shot yourself. I swallowed it. Now, look. Somebody's taken a couple of shots at you, Dan. Nobody can tell us anything about it but you so far. We don't want you murdered. Well? Okay, boys. Get the ambulance back to... Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're hurt. You're going to the police hospital. No, no. I've served my time and I'm clean. Being shot at even in this state doesn't make you a criminal. Dollar. Yeah, Dan. Do me a favor. Would you phone a private hospital and have me taken there? Go ahead, Johnny. Take it easy, Dan. I did as he asked. A crew from one of the large private hospitals was out there in a matter of minutes. And an hour and a half later, Dan Valentine was operated on and the bullet successfully removed from his shoulder. I waited around until he was taken to a private room and Inspector DeBaca waited with me. Dollar? Yeah? Why don't you go back to Hartford? This isn't any of your business. I know. My plane takes off at four. I'll be on it. Why are you waiting around here? Oh, to see how he is, I guess. Your pal of yours? I just met him last night, you know that. But you're waiting around? Yeah. You want me to tell you why you're waiting around? You want to make sure he's okay. 
You met him last night, and outside of what you ever read or heard about him, you don't know him from a load of coal. But you want to make sure he's going to be all right. Well, so do I. Because in that room and on that bed lies quite a man. Well, that about summed it up. No matter what he had been or what he had done, Dan Valentine was quite a man. It was the same thing that had caused me to go over to him the night before and start a conversation. The same thing that caused me to believe his plans for living a quiet life in New Orleans. He came out of the anesthetic a half hour later and he sent for me. Hi. Hi. They say it's going to be okay. Oh, sure, sure. This is nothing. I just wanted to thank you for giving me a hand. Tabaka could probably help you more. All you have to do is tell him who shot you and why. I shot myself, and just for something to do. Look, Dan, I have a fair idea of how tough things were for you and how tough they can be now. But Inspector DeBaca understands it, too. He'll do everything he can to help you, but you have to help him, Dan. DeBaca's a good boy. You're right. You'll tell him who shot you? If there was any way he could help me, I'd let him know first. I'll handle this myself. Guess you'll want to be getting your airplane. Yeah. Good luck, kiddo. Same to you. I went back to my hotel, picked up my bags, and took a cab to Mobilan Airport. My plane had developed engine trouble, and there was going to be a five-hour delay. I killed time at the bar and in the restaurant and just standing around looking at the field at night. By that time, the newspapers carried the story of the attempt on Dan Valentine's life. It was as skimpy as the story Dan had told himself, and it troubled me. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Long distance call for you from Hartford. Uh, you can take it right in there. Oh, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Roy Vickers, Johnny, at New Britain Mutual. Glad I caught you. Just waiting for my plane back to Hartford now. The story about Dan Valentine's and all the papers up here. Have you read it? Yeah, I was in on it, in a way. Somebody shot at him today. He won't tell who. Says he'll handle it himself. Can you find out, Johnny? Well, I don't know. Why? We carry a $50,000 policy on him. If somebody's trying to kill him, we'd like to know all about it. You mean I can stay here and work on this? Yes. Okay, Roy. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Valentine matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, all the King's men that could be the New Orleans police force try to keep one man alive. And they almost do it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.